at one point in 2009, I think, you walked out in front of a car here in Devonport. What state of mind were you in at that time? Yeah, look, by then I was um, pretty much gone. I had had the opportunity, they were putting Botox shots into my back and that really helped in 2007. Unfortunately, that doctor passed away um, and for some reason, apparently Veterans Affairs couldn't organise a Botox to get down to Tasmania. I mean, this is, this is the sort of department we're playing with. So my GPs that I'd had um, since I first came back home in the early 2000s, he was begging them to send down the Botox because he couldn't get it either. Um, so it wasn't available in Tasmania? No, no. Wow. No, apart from one doctor was using it, not that we knew of anyway. Mm. So, um, so I guess it was like you in 2007 when they start putting it in and then Nick Sherry let me, the former senator down here, Senator Sherry, let me come back and do a return to work mm. in his office six months. So you started getting a taste of it thinking, geez, I might be able to just mm. get my life back in order mm. and, and, you know, get back to the point where at least I can work for 30 or 40 hours a week. And then when they took that off me, it was like just another slap down. I just couldn't take another one. So when you said you were nearly gone, what does that mean? So I, I was pretty much, I, I'd given up by then. I just thought then you're still you know, in chronic not pain. Know, I was still in chronic pain. Um, I'd had a touch of what it was like to have normality back in my life again and maybe, you know, open those dreams to say, well, maybe I can beat this pain threshold thing. And then that was taken off me. And I just, I just looked back and thought, I can't do this for another eight, nine years. I can't do this anymore. I just can't. There was nothing left of me. I was just like an empty human shell. And so you walked out in front of this car? Yeah, I walked out in front of the car. And what happened after that? Um, and then I think it was the next day that um, I woke up. I was sort of in and out of consciousness. And then the next day I woke up and I had my dad and my two sons standing there just looking at me. And you'd written letters to them, hadn't yes. you? Yes. To say you yep. didn't want to live anymore? No, and they could, they could have whatever we had left just split between the both of them. How do you then face those people again? Yeah, um, facing were, them, it was yeah, quite difficult like really that. Hard. That it's very etched in my head, just looking at their faces mm. um, when they were standing over the top of me, and I, they didn't know how to handle the situation either. They knew I was in a bad way, and I think everybody knew I was in a bad way, but they didn't actually think that I'd go that far. Mm. So, um, so that was quite difficult. We all had to work through that. But the upside to that is, you wouldn't believe it, but Veterans Affairs started to help me out. So that was that a turning point then? That was a turning point, yeah. And what was your kids and, and dad's reaction to, to that? Yeah, I think it um, probably took them a little while to get over to that. The kids were a little bit funny uh, for a little while and then sort of within that two weeks I was down, I, I'd had my first um, visit to the clinic. So mm. I had my mum and family, they were sort of around the boys. So I think that helped men think the boys were a little bit older too. So. Mm. To them, I think it surprised them that I did what I did, but it really didn't shock them because they'd seen, you know, they'd seen me back in my army days when they were younger saying, well, you know, mum works lots of hours, she's out there, she's bloody doing physical training all the time, things like that. And then to end it like that um, was a bit of a, you know, they've watched me for nine years going through misery. Mm. And there's this assumption also that families are just going to somehow magically work that stuff out. It's like, you do need the help around you, you do need the social worker at the hospital, you do need a psychologist to become involved and care to be there because you're dealing with a family, not just the person, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think so. And I, it's the same with my younger son, um, you know, with his drug troubles and that that he had, because Dylan was my main carer. Mm. And that's why I say, you know, I, what he went through, it doesn't surprise me. Mm. It just doesn't surprise me because he was a great kid inside the house. He'd do anything. Uh, not an issue whatsoever. As soon as he went out that front door, it was just must have been so much relief that, oh, God, I can leave mum inside the house and I can just go and let my hair down. Mm. 